All right, hey guys. Today we're going to talk about all things related to lipedema from recovery to what causes it, how can you tell at home, what are the treatments from non-surgical to surgical, uh, what happens kind of after the procedure itself, and I kind of have it like all these questions written down, so we're going to go one by one. But let me write down here to, uh, for people to write their questions below, uh, just in case we get any other questions be beyond the ones that we're going to discuss. Um, awesome. Okay. So let me pin it. Perfect. So the first one I would like to address is the uh, recovery. And kind of like how is the recovery kind of afterwards? Is, so after the lippy lipo, patients like immediately they walk out kind of after the surgery because it's done fully awake, no sedation, no general anesthesia. You just kind of like walk out immediately after. So very fast recovery compared to, because we used to do them like under the general anesthesia in the past. And uh, with that, then after the anesthesia effects go away, patients are kind of wheel to the, to, the, uh, to the car. And so we don't have that anymore. That being said, what they have is the bruising, the swelling, all that we see that, um, and usually peaks around two weeks after the procedure, and then it starts to taper down. Now, that being said, for the final, final outcome, it's usually about six months to a year, depending on how much swelling they have. Let's say somebody who's like stage four lipedema, who has lipedema lymphedema, I mean, they will have like lifelong swelling and they will need to be on compression for a very long time. But for people who don't have uh, stage four, like, like stage one, stage one and two, usually in about a year, they'll kind of get to that final outcome. And uh, now the question that comes is, which patients do they need compression for life and which patients they need compression just for eight weeks and which patients for six months and how do we decide from a compression standpoint the longevity of how long to use it so i tell people it's like around 60 70 percent of patients they need it kind of like immediately around the surgery uh, for about eight weeks afterwards and then you have around 30 percent of patients they would need it kind of as needed let's say if they are flight attendants or they will they stand up on their feet all day, they're like, you know, in, in healthcare. Um, then they need compression just during certain activities. And 10% of patients, they would need it lifelong, especially if somebody who started at a later stage, uh, those patients will, because they have some element of lymphedema at that point, and in that case, they will need compression, lifelong compression for that. Uh, and that kind of like, that's why it's important to treat it early on to minimize progression going from stage one to stage two, stage three, stage four. So that's kind of like, kind of in a nutshell, from a recovery standpoint, to talk about the causes. Uh, a lot of people ask, kind of like, you know, what causes lipedema? It's, it's a genetic disease. It's autosomal dominant. It runs in family. Now, we don't see it in guys because there's also a hormonal component to it. So basically, it's mutated in, uh, it's muted. In, uh, in males. So we mainly see it in women. It starts around puberty and it gets worse with pregnancy. Uh, and it gets, with each pregnancy, it tends to kind of advance until you get to menopause. And then we really see a progression around menopause. We've also seen it with patients who had their ovaries removed. That causes a lot of stress on the body from a hormonal shift. And that also advances the lipedema. So earlier treatment is key to minimize progression uh, of the disease. So treating it early is like, especially when you're stage one, stage two, also the advantage of early treatment is it minimizes the chances of the skin expanding so much. So the chances of skin resection goes down with early treatment. Because if you treat at stage one or early stage two, the chances of skin resection is almost zero because you know the skin is gonna be uh, well. But let's say somebody who's stage three or stage four, and then we take 10, 15, 20 liters out over multiple sessions, then the skin is not gonna hydrate as well as somebody who we've only taken three or four liters out. So then the chances of skin resection in late stages will be much higher than somebody at an earlier stages. So that's kind of like from, it goes back to really early treatment is key. Um, not only to say the amount of sessions will, will, that's needed is less, and uh, it's just it makes it easier for uh, throughout uh, for the patient as well as for the treating physician. 
another question is like the diagnosis, like, you know, what type of diagnosis are there for lipedema and how can I know if I have it or not? Currently, there's no like blood test where, you know, get your blood and check it out and see kind of like, you know, if you have lipedema or not. So lipedema diagnosis has been based on uh, symptoms kind of presentation people say hey I have easy bruising if somebody touches me it's just I get pain um, uh, pain to touch to the area swelling um, heaviness at the end of the day I cannot keep up with my family I cannot keep up with my kids uh, all these are typical symptoms of lipedema uh, sometimes like changes in kind of like sensation gait at with late stages patients would have like uh, gait problems not only from the lipedema fat but also from the nerves themselves because the lipedema fats irritate the nerve and then people have problems from proprioception kind of like that stability and their gait issues so these all fall under lipedema and also so these are the kind of we call them the what are the symptoms patients are having and then the 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 shape or the signs of lipedema are usually kind of like the shape of the leg tree trunk appearance uh, the foot is usually normal unless late stage of stage four where you have swelling of the foot then it becomes more lipedema lymphedema but in a stage four with lipedema case or stage one to three the foot is normal the puffiness starts at the ankle and goes up now that being said i've had some patients saying here that uh, you know my ankles are normal but i do have lipedema and they are correct because not all lipedema on stage three, where the swelling goes from the waist all the way down to the ankle, that's, you know, stage three, or type three lipedema, where it kind of goes all the way down. Some people are type one or type two. Type one, where you have it that kind of like around the upper buttock area, kind of we call it kind of, they have that wheel effect or kind of like that, that tile. Uh, and uh, in that, the with type two, it goes down to the knees, but it spares the ankles. The ankles are normal. Um, in type 3, which is the most common type, it goes all the way down. So you can still have lipedema and be type 1 and type 2 with normal ankles. That's very, you know, that's, we've seen that. Um, and then some people have it in the arms and the way you can tell it's gonna, it can progress from the inner elbow area. You see kind of you pinch and then you feel the fat and then it goes all the way down to the wrist and that's how you know if you have it in your arms as well. We've seen that some patients have it in the buffalo hump area, kind of in that area as well. Uh, sometimes in the scalp, you can feel the nodules of lipedema. So pretty much, I mean, like uh, there's so much variations. Now we put them under five types, but doing hundreds and hundreds of these cases, there's many more types, but you know, probably infinite because different bodies are different and they have different expression of the lipedema uh, gene. So that's kind of from where, where the deposition, uh, where, where the lipedema is. Now in terms of kind of like, you know, does it progress over time or once we do the liposuction, does it come back? And kind of these are common questions that patients are asking is, uh, does it progress over time? Let's say without treatment, okay? So we'll go without treatment and with treatment. Let's say without treatment, it does progress over time or they tend to progress. Extreme stress, pregnancy, menopause, GYN surgery, they tend to advance lipedema. And the problem is it becomes a vicious cycle because that's what happens. The lipedema fat obstructs the lymphatics. The more obstruction we have, the more fibrosis we have, the more scar tissue we have. The more we have, then the, then the lymphatic backflow to the heart, it becomes obstructed. So now lipedema progresses to lymphedema. So you go from a smaller problem into a much larger problem. So it actually progresses itself outside having progression on the hormonal side. So add to it the hormonal side, which is menopause and pregnancy and all that stuff, it kind of adds to the internal progression of the disease. So that's kind of like where it is. Now, what if we treat it? Let's say, okay, we go in patients in their 30s, 40s, say, hey, you know what, let's go and do lipolipo and kind of get as many lipedema fat cells out. That helps it. Um, it helps it tremendously and the reason for that is it helps it on two sides one it, it minimizes progression because now you have said let's say have, you know 100 fat cells the pedema fat cells and then you take 90 out now you have only 10 uh, the body to work against so it already you took care of 90 now the question comes will it come back like can we go from 10 back to 50 I haven't seen that um, once you take lipedema fat cells out, they don't come back. Now, that being said, if somebody is not like, 
uh, following like good diet, exercise, watching what they eat, anti-inflammatory diet, and let's say the arms were not treated or the thighs were not treated, the residual lipidema fat cells can progress or they go through menopause or you know of extreme stress, then the residual area or the areas that were not treated can progress. I haven't seen anybody where we've done the life on them, got them where they need to be, and they come back later and kind of like, now they're stage three, and they were like stage two or stage three before that they were three. We just don't see it, it's not common. So uh, uh, that's why we feel like early treatment is key, treat it as soon as you know ski, before menopause, before pregnancy if you can, or like uh, get rid of that lipidema fat cells, it's gonna help you in the long run. So that's, that's key. Um, Sarv is asking a question here, and I'll take the questions as they come, guys. Um, will the skin be more prone to bruising, etc., after the surgery? Because my skin is sensitive to bruise and everything. Absolutely. Uh, good question. Lipidema patients, per se, they, they, one of the signs and symptoms of lipidema is easy bruising. And part of that is lipidema, it's not only a, lipid, a fat storage disease, it's also a collagen disease. So the, the walls of the vessels, of the veins and the venules or, are so fragile that any small, tiny trauma to it, you get a bruise from it. So with liposuction, patients who have lipedema are more prone to bruising and swelling than somebody who doesn't have lipedema. So the answer is yes, just because it's the collagen, it's a collagen problem as well. And the more that you know we study lipedema, the more we can uh, know about it. Uh, get sugar certified is asking, can you do lippy lipo and remove a Baker cyst on a leg? Um, we've had many patients with Baker cyst. Uh, we still do lippy lipo, but with the lippy lipo, we treat the Baker cyst, it will not. It's, it's present in a different plane. So the lippy lipo, lipidema liposuction, is done on the lipidema fat, and that's where the lipidema fat sits, between the skin and the muscle. So anything in that area, or well, most of the fat in that area is being liposuctioned and to get to the outcome and take care of lipedema. But when you go below the muscle or down to the joint, you don't want to go there because it's unsafe to do it with liposuction. The treatment there is open and kind of take it out like, you know, uh, surgically. So it will not feed the Baker cyst. It's a very good question and we get that. Uh, I've had a patient with Baker cyst and her question originally was, can you do it despite having a Baker, despite having Baker cyst? And the answer yes, because it sits in a different plane. It's not sitting in a plane where we can go in, target it, and uh, and that. So it's actually you know you can do it, but it's not gonna treat your Baker cyst. You'd always have a Baker cyst. Now that being said, most patients they have those nodules that sit behind the the knees and can be misdiagnosed as Baker cyst. Actually, it's a fat pad. It's a lipidema fat pad and the treatment is liposuction. So you gotta make sure you truly have Baker cyst. Now if they did imaging and they see Baker cyst, then it's late Baker cyst and the treatment is, is different than liposuction. But if they haven't done imaging and they think it's Baker cyst based on that, make sure it is truly Baker cyst and not um, lipedema fat pad. Because there is a fat pad that sits on the back of the knee and kind of like, and as that progresses, that fat pad actually prevents the knee movement and patients over time they're not able to bend the knee because the calf muscle the calf fat pad that sits on top of the calf kind of like progresses in this direction and the knee the knee fat that sits be behind the knee it also progresses in that direction and then when the knee joints kind of flexes the, these two fat pads hit each other and then it limits the range of motion of the knee. So patients, after we do their lippy lipo, even immediately until they're like, oh my God, my mobility is already much better. I'm able to bend the knee more just because there's nothing obstructing the movement of the knee once those flat pads are removed. Um, uh, good question. Um, CDL Master Training is, is saying, uh, uh, I, I admire your work and been thinking on taking a family member to you for the procedure. Thank you so much. Currently, I'm venturing others as. Well, that's awesome. You gotta, you gotta, you know, with lipedema, you gotta make sure you do your homework. Um, yeah. Make sure you go to somebody who done 
hundreds of these cases. They're very challenging, um, especially for somebody who's like early stages, because the, the risk of over resection and resulting with contour irregularities and fibrosis and scar tissue like significantly higher. It's not like typical regular liposuction. So, and uh, you gotta be very careful. See a lot of before and afters, take a look at them, ask many questions. How many do you do? How many do you do a day? That's a very good question. Because I'll tell you this, and <clears throat> we used to do, you know, we used to do under the general anesthesia, then we progressed to awake lipi lipo, and we used to do many a day, and then to one a day, and, and I'll tell you, doing hundreds of these is, it does take time to get consistent great results. And why is that? Because if you truly think about it is, if one person is doing the procedure, okay, you gotta numb the front of the leg on one side, and then the front on the other side, then you gotta ask the patient to flip and then numb the back on one side and then the back on the other side. And then you have to give it time for the numbing medicine to kind of like, to soak in and take in. And that takes at least an hour to an hour and a half, okay? Then you go to the liposuction part and if you wanna get a great outcome, you wanna use tiny little cannulas to be able to go in and curve them and bend them in a way so that you extract most of the fat, have the patient uh, tighten the muscle and relax to really get the perfect outcome. And that takes about an hour and a half to two hours to do. So now you're about three hours to four hours into the case. And then you're gonna spend time to sculpt at the end to make sure everything is nice and smooth because the pedema fat is thick and fibrous. So you gotta make sure you equalize it and you kind of like, you, you break it into small pieces so that you don't have those contour irregularities. And that takes about an hour, an hour and a half. So it's taking about like four to six hours, depending on how much patients have irregularities, nodularity to do, to do that case. Uh, in a way where a patient is safe, is not feeling the discomfort, and if they're feeling gonna change the technique and all that stuff and getting that consistent outcome. So imagine you do that six hours and then you start with another patient for another six hours. So it's very hard to maintain that high, high quality when you do two or three or four a day. You gotta rush it because now you have patients waiting in the waiting room, people complaining, oh, it's taking so long, is everything is fine back there and it really makes it hard. So can you do volume? You can at the expense of quality or you gotta put patients to sleep and you just, knock them out. And that goes down the route of insurance, of all the other stuff. It can be done, but if you're looking for the best outcome possible and the best results possible, that's the reason for that. And I've done it like always. So um, you, you name the technique, I've done it. You name the way of doing it, I've done it. And, uh, and I'm talking from like experience, from doing so, so many times. And we found that um, doing one a day, taking the time, being consistent in our results, consistent in our outcomes, have great experience for patients is what works best. The downside of doing it this way, the way we're doing it is you can only do one a day. Um, it, it, and that's kind of like, it's kind of like the, like everything in life, you know, there's pros and there's cons. I wish we can do two a day or three a day. I mean, that would be great, right? From a business standpoint, you want to do as many cases as you can. You know, the staff is here, everything's here. It's the same overhead, right? So it, financially it makes sense for us, but it's not be the best for the patient. So we're kind of like in that, in that phases. And that's something like, you know, we don't talk about uh, much, but it's important for uh, patients to understand that. So uh, when you're doing your homework, kind of like, I would ask the questions, how many they've done, look at the before and afters, long-term before and afters, how many you they're getting done that day, does the surgeon do other stuff? Like, you know, cause like you don't want to go to somebody who does like, you know, face and neck and eyes and this and that and breast and tummy and that and the pedema and this and fat transfer. And I mean, it's like, you know, jack of all trades, you know, you gotta, you, you gotta be careful because what we found is, if, if that procedure is not done well, it's very hard to collect. And it, it's just very, you gotta do it right from the get-go. It's much easier to get it right from the beginning than to start patching and moving things around and that it just becomes uh, very challenging. Um, Dahlia is asking, uh, can I use machine Rena Sculpt? It's a machine very weak to remove fat from body. Uh, I'm not very familiar with, the, with that machine. Um, it's, not, it's not about 
the machine or even the technique or kind of like uh, with the pedima because there's so much variations it's really about the experience of the person doing it how many they've done are they consistent with their results um, I wish that there's a machine out there that you can just plug it and gives you a great result I mean that would be ideal right now you can treat 11% of women worldwide right I mean that would be a game, you know, that will be, I mean, the, the future, right? If you can plug something and then it just doesn't exist. It's just too good to be true. Uh, what we found, I mean, that's, it's, it's the, um, it's not, you know, it's not the brush, it's the painter. Uh, it really is. Um, there's no magic wand in, in lipedema. It's, you gotta take the time, take the effort, do the right thing. We get asked a lot about like, you know, J plasma, vaser, laser, energy devices, all that stuff. It's like, you know, how are you getting these amazing results? What are you doing to the skin? All that stuff. And we don't use any of that. We, we had all the technologies you can think of. We had it in our practice. And my experience has found like energy devices tend to cause fibro fibrosis, scar tissue, burns. There's a lot of complications that come with them. Potentially at... Mm, from a benefit standpoint, it's very debatable because when I started doing lipid lipo, I was like, you know what, the skin is doing so well uh, with the lipid lipo. And I was like, you know what, I wonder if, if because we can say, oh yeah, we use this device, it's great, look at the skin, it looks perfect. You're like, oh my God, I'm gonna pay extra money for that device. But it's all not real, it's all marketing. Uh, I mean, does it really make a difference? And to be able to really know, that's what we need to do. One leg you do it with, laser, vaser, plasma, whatever you want to do it, and the other leg you do it just pure lipid lipo and look at the results. And if you get better results with lipid lipo, and you will, um, and that, again, that's my personal opinion, then the question is, why do I pay extra money for that and get the potential of fibrosis, scar tissue, burns from that part? But where the where the market is, where the machine, where the money is in the market is on selling the machines. I mean, that's a huge industry in in in, in medical uh, things that are, and that's something that you know you just you can't fight. So kind of like, because I mean, I get that all the time. It's like, hey, you know what? We we will provide the machine for you. You just do it and that, and it's like it's just not the right thing to do. Um, because I, if that was my wife, or that was my daughter, <laughs> I'm doing the pilipo. It's just not worth it. And potentially, it's bad for the lymphatics, fibrosis, and all that stuff. We don't know the long-term ramification. I mean, it's no different than the non-invasive stuff that used to be done. It's like, oh, and I, and I still have patients from there that wasted money on stuff that didn't work. They go, it's like, oh yeah, you do it. You don't need surgery, all that stuff, and then no outcome. And now the patient wasted money, now they have more scalp tissue, now I need to fix the irregularities from that. And it's just, unfortunately, the world like revolves around, uh, a lot around stuff that doesn't work, that makes money for the people who are doing it at the time. And then when time passes and uh, the person paying the price is actually the patient. But unfortunately, no one talks about it because let's say I'm doing that stuff. Well, I gonna come and talk about it, right? And it's like, ah, oh, because well, I've done the patient yesterday this way, and hmm, she's gonna be mad because, and that becomes a conflict of interest. And you have to think about it as a patient. It's like, what's the conflict of interest? And let's say if it practice paid half a million dollars for something, and now, you know, like, they gotta use it because, you know, they gotta survive. And then, so anyhow, like, it's just you gotta really do your homework. You gotta really know what you're getting into, and uh, and that's where go after the expert, see the results, make sure you connect with the person, and just you know like because um, unfortunately most people don't know what they don't know, and it's a very uh, it's a new era. It's uh, a lot of people are jumping on it, and a lot of people are learning, and uh, the patients are paying the price. Good question. Um, okay, let's keep on going here. Uh, Dalia is asking, uh, I have lymphedema. Can I use the sculpt machine to remove fat and make muscles? Again, I think I just answered that. I'll be very careful with that. Uh, most of the non-invasive stuff that I've seen don't work, especially with lipedema. If anything, it makes it worse. 
I've seen some people develop what we call PIH or paradoxical adipose hyperplasia from uh, cool sculpting on patients, on or like non-invasive on patients with lipidema, kind of got the opposite effect. And those were, she was so hard to correct. And, and, and I did her probably like three years ago. And at the time I didn't know that, you know, that's kind of the side effect from the non-invasive machines. And it's like going through cement. I mean, like the cannula wouldn't compress. And then, then I was asking the patient and then she told me kind of like, oh, by the way, I had this done. And I was like, oh my God. It's like, okay, so when you had it done, did you improve? Did it stay the same or did it got worse? She's like, actually, you know what? It got worse after I've done that. I was like, that makes total sense. So instead of the fat going away because of the trauma and the inflammation, it actually, she got the opposite effect. And when you do the opposite effect, you get more scarring and fibrosis and scar tissue. And then it becomes so hard to correct. And then on these cases, and I learned the hard way, you gotta wait. You gotta wait like six months to a year for the body to kind of start breaking some of those scar tissue out and then go in and like suction. So, I mean, it was a big deal for her. We got her to a great point, but Again, like that's, I would be very, very careful with non-invasive on lipedema patients. Um, so, but you know what guys, like that, that makes it tricky because like you can say, oh, you know what, of course he's saying that because he does lipilipo. I mean, yeah, he's not gonna tell you go do non-invasive and that's what he does. And that's where people are like, patients are getting like multiple. And then the non-invasive people, like, you know, they have a med spa or something, it's like, oh, you know, that's gonna work great. Um, I guess you can take both sides, but we've been doing that for many, many years, right? And we would never like put our branding or reputation online for, for a short-term gain. We know what works. We know what works really, really well. And I guess we're just saying it hopefully to minimize potential wrong decisions made on the kind of on the patient side. Just kind of try to help as much as possible. Um, get get uh, certified, ask any colleague recommendations in Texas. You know, no one that I know is doing lipo, lipo, lipo. I'm the only one in the country who does lipo, lipo the way I do it. Because the way we do it, no sedation, no general anesthesia, purely awake, uh, liposuction, one case a day, um, great outcomes, consistent. Like a patient comes here, we're gonna post the results. No question about it. So with that confident, with our, ex you know, with our expertise, experience, and the results we're gonna provide. So um, there's a lot of people who are now doing, you know, lipedema, uh, liposuction or lipo, regular liposuction on lipedema patients. Um, and uh, and they, they can be great physicians and great surgeons, but I would be careful as they are going through that learning curve, which is very steep in lipedema. You don't want to be that person where you are being used to go through that training curve. Make sure they, they know what they're doing. Make sure they know they've done it so many times. Make sure if they get in trouble, make sure they know how to get out of trouble. If they get severe control irregularities, can they fix that? Or now they're gonna send you to us. And now it becomes like very awkward. Uh, Cause I'm like, okay, well, you know, you know, you didn't come to us, but now we have to fix somebody else's problem. And now it's like, okay, how are we gonna do it? And then they just already have paid so much for it. and now. And it's just like, it becomes so hard on the patient because, so that's why I'm like, do the right thing from the beginning. It's just much easier for you. It's, um, it's just, it, it saves you so much on the long, on the, on the long run. Um, and life, I mean, uh, you really, you, you get what you, what you pay for. It is what it is, you know, it's kind of, unfortunately, that's what it is. Um, I'm not saying, why don't you come to Lebanon? Um, I operate only in the US, actually out of one location. Most of our patients fly to us. So um, it's just like the time for me to take, because to, if I fly to other country um, to do surgeries, then we have to stop doing surgeries here. And if we stop doing surgeries here, we're delaying our patients here. And that's the efficiency is not as good as here, because here the team knows me, I know everything, everything we know where it is, we, we, we are consistent with our experience. When you fly and that, you're gonna lose time, time to fly, time to come back, delay the patients, and already we're booked. So basically we're very cognizant on our time, how to spend our time, where to spend it, and how to service as many patients as possible. So uh, we, we don't, we get invited, I mean, throughout to go and operate, we just, uh, uh, we just don't. CDL Master is asking appointment slots do you have? Uh, link in bio, so you send the information and then uh, 
uh, you'll be required to send you the new patient paperwork to see kind of that and the photos. And then after that, we'll send you to a consultation and then you kind of, we can take it from there. Uh, we are opening some slots for the next, I mean, we were fully booked till 2026 and we get so many people like, you know, I want to go with you, but I don't want to wait for two years to get my surgery done. And I was like, you know, and I was thinking about it. It's like, you know what, like, I get it. I mean, if that was my wife, if that was my daughter and she wants to go to someone, but they cannot get her in for two years. And I was like, we need to figure something out. So I kind of like, you know, sat with the staff and kind of like figured out, we opened certain days, I had some conferences, we kind of moved some conferences around, all that stuff. So we do have few open slots to be able to accommodate the people who are kind of like really, really want to get in and uh, just be able to accommodate. So we do have some available, not a lot, like very few. So if you want to send, send your stuff kind of like sooner than later. Uh, Daniela is asking recovery time. So with lippy lipo, you're totally awake. I mean, patients are just immediately walking out. So that's kind of like, I mean, it's as fast, it's unbelievable. Like literally, I walk with the patient out every single time. And they're like, I can't believe it. I mean, I just had like surgery and I'm walking out because they don't take any pain medications. They don't take anything by IV, no sedate. I mean, that's nothing. It's like, I mean, they take Tylenol and Advil <laughs> for the procedure. I mean, we might maximize it. But that being said, you're still gonna have bruising and swelling, you know, that we have no control over. But in terms of recovery, like mental and that, and kind of going back to working on the laptop and all that stuff, most people like second day, third day. Now, pain will creep up in the next like couple of days afterwards because like as the numbing kind of starts going away, patient will feel it. So you wanna stay on 24 uh, seven of, you know, Tylenol and Advil to kind of keep it at bay. But uh, mainly the, the recovery is mainly from bruising and swelling. Uh, not from anesthesia, zero anesthesia. Um, good questions. Uh, because uh, it's asking, hello doctor, do you work with bariatric patients? I mean, we do. And uh, actually most lipedema patients have at, or a lot of part of bariatric patients who have lipedema, their lipedema doesn't improve with bariatric surgery. So they lose the regular fat but then they come to us and they have like wide lipedema fat in their legs. And that fat you can't do anything about except lipolipo. So a lot of them that actually they lost so much weight from bariatric, but they cannot get rid of lipedema. So basically we end up doing their liposuction for their lipedema. Now that being said, lip bariatric patients are a little bit more tricky than uh, non-bariatric patients because most of bariatric patients, especially in the thigh areas, they've lost a lot of regular fat, so they have laxity to start with. And then they have the lipedema fat sitting below the uh, excess skin. So we have to really go and search for the lipedema fat to take that out. And the mistake that I've seen bariatric patients happening to them is they, they lose the, the, the regular fat from their bariatric surgery, and then they go get a, get a thigh lift or a skin resection. And then, but their lipedema fat hasn't been treated, and then they come to me after the fact. And I was like, ah, they wasted one surgery because they needed to take the lipedema fat before they get that skin resection. Because now let's say they did the bariatric, they got the skin resection, but they haven't done anything to the lipedema fat. The problem is that when I do the liposuction for lipedema fat, especially if they have more than 10 liters, 15 liters, now they have extra skin, now they need another skin resection. So if you're a bariatric patient, you've lost, you've lost the regular fat, you still have lipedema fat, don't do any skin resection. Wait, get your lipolipo done first, and then do your skin resection as the last part of your recovery. And this is very, very important. Um, Dalia is asking, I have lymphedema stage two. Um, I asked for my body, not my legs. I have the lymphedema at my legs. So, uh, and we gotta be, Dalia here, the, the two things you gotta, is lipedema versus lymphedema. So lipedema, it's a different entity than lymphedema. Now lipedema can progress to become lymphedema. So you have like, you know, stage one, stage two, stage three, lipedema. And then when you get to stage four, lipedema pushes the body to become stage four lipid lymphedema. So, uh, so you gotta see kind of like what the causes are. Uh, lymphedema per se, if somebody who comes in who has like one leg lymphedema from let's say cancer or radiation and that, we don't treat those. 
uh, we only our practice is only dedicated to lipedema patients but if the lymphedema is from the lipedema then yes then 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 we would do lipid life on those patients good question um, Proand is asking, I was diagnosed with mild stage one lipedema. Would I still need two surgeries or could it possibly do in one session? Good question. So stage one patients, especially mild, these are the toughest patients to treat. And that's very important because patients tend to think that, oh, I'm stage one, I'm easy, I don't have much, it's gonna be like super easy. So, and, a, a novice surgeon or an experienced surgeon might think the same. But that's the biggest mistake because stage one, early stage one patients are the toughest patients to treat. Why is that? Because if a surgeon is not experienced and they over resect, and you're, you, you're very prone for over resection or over liposuction, you end up with horrible control irregularities that cannot be fixed and that can cause scar tissue and that can cause discoloration on the skin and these are like very very hard problems to treat so stage one lipedema you gotta make sure you you see an expert even more than stage four lipedema because you got like extreme stage one or stage four right there's more room for error in stage one than there are in stage four so so you gotta make sure you you do it right and you want to treat it early on, but that's kind of where the, the expertise come in play. So you have to make sure that stage one, we use tiny, 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 the smallest cannula possible. The longest time, like six hours these cases take us because like we spend a lot of time to make sure it's nice and smooth at the end. Because if it's not, if, if it doesn't look perfect at the end of the surgery, it's not going to look perfect in the future. So you got to make sure at the end it looks as good as it can be. So these cases, this is where problems I see the most actually. Now to go back to, can, can I do it in one session or two? The more you do, the less specific you, it becomes. What I mean by that is, when you do those legs, you're doing 360 to the knees, 360 to the calves, 360 to the ankles. And then if you do go all the way up, now you have 360 to the thighs, 360 to the saddlebags. So the amount that's spent, you're talking about six to eight hours of surgery in there, kind of to do that. The limitation comes, it's not how much fat to take out, because stage one, you're not going to have five liters. You're going to have maybe two, maybe three, especially if you're mild stage one. The mistake that I see that if people go to five liters, you're going to have bad control irregularities, guaranteed 100%. So the limitation in the experienced hand on stage one it's the amount of numbing medicine that is injected. Because there's a limit. Above that limit, it goes into lidocaine toxicity, which can like affect the heart, not, you know, seizures, all that stuff. You don't wanna go into that. So you wanna stage it, not because of the five liters, but because of the toxicity. So even if you're mild stage one, you still need two. One knees down and one knees up. And we stage it in two days apart. We do one on Tuesday and one on Thursday. So we give one day for the body to relax and to absorb all the numbing medicine so we can maximize numbing medicine on, on, the, on Thursday. So that's very, very crucial. Um, Dalia is saying thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Beauty House <coughs> saying you do a great job. Thanks. I'm working in Spain like physical therapist with the Pedema patient. Uh, well, thank you for sharing. Um, and really, you know, to kind of quick thing about physical therapists, I mean, they, they're a huge part of the, especially after surgery, before and after, because getting the fluid out, making the fluid through the lymphatics, activating the lymphatics to kind of like, because after surgery, the body is like, ah, because of the, you know, of the, of the liposuction and, and kind of like all the cannulas in and out. So, you know, can, so you gotta like, it's like a baby, you gotta massage it and kind of like get let that fluid. So the, I've seen patients who get good MLD after that procedure tend to feel better afterwards, tend to kind of get faster to that final outcome faster. And I think if they have a good relationship to start with beforehand, it's even better because they already established that relationship. 
they're more prepared, they know what to expect, and they have at least somebody to support them, somebody to talk to, somebody knows what they're doing. So it's, it's, it's crucial to have a good physical therapist, MLD therapist to help you with your journey afterwards and preferably beforehand. Uh, Dalia is asking, I ask a lot of doctors, they tell me that there's no way to make any kind of operation for lymphedema. I'm not sure I agree with that. Uh, I'm, I believe you, but I, I would look for other doctors. Uh, unfortunately, uh, whoever is giving you that recommendation is not true. Um, there are many operations that can be done for lipedema and many operations that can be done for lymphedema and many operations that can be done for lipedema and lymphedema. So whoever is giving you that advice, I would definitely seek a second opinion because uh, it's not correct. I mean, there's the uh, lymphatic to venous bypass, there's liposuction that can be done for lymphedema. That's, I mean, depending on what your etiology is, there's always a solution. Now, I don't know your full history, so I cannot like guide you with that, but I can tell you, uh, whenever somebody tells you that's no, it doesn't mean that's no, it doesn't mean that they don't know any better. <laughs> to them, it's a no, but there's always a way to kind of get things done. So I would personally look somewhere else. Uh, and that's unfortunately, that's what lipedema patients go through. Like, I mean, most of them, they were told like, you know, liposuction below, below the knee, cannot be done uh, or it's unsafe, don't do it. Like I remember when I started doing lipedema many years ago, I mean liposuction along the knees and I was like, you know, even for my own colleagues, like, oh my God, like, you know, cause we, that's how we were taught and training. Like you never go below the knee, you never liposuction the ankles. It's not safe, it's high risk area. There's a lot of important suction, which is true. You gotta do it like the right hands. You gotta have an expert. So, so, so most of these surgeons, they were telling people like, oh, you know what? Basically, you're just fat and you have no solution. Good luck. And it's not true. So when you look backwards, so all these, all these advice from the expert, and they're great people, board certified plastic surgeons, I mean, great, you know, good physicians, but they didn't know better. And it's not like they did that on purpose. They truly believed that is no solution. And this is just fat that needs to sit there and you gotta diet and exercise and do better from that standpoint. So I would be careful, you know, kind of like, uh, that's always a solution. That's always a way uh, to get what you need to get. So I would put someone else uh, personally. <clears throat> I mean, we've done it, we do it. <laughs> we've done it hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times and that's all what we do. So. There's always a solution. Don't, don't let people tell you uh, no or uh, it cannot be done or there's always a way. Um, got you guys saying, thanks for answering my questions. I'll be making an appointment soon. Um, thank you. Looking forward to it. Um, uh, I see a question. I think it's uh, a language that I don't speak. If you, uh, if you ask it in, in, in English or even French or Arabic, I can, I can answer those, but um, that language I, I don't know how to speak. Um, uh, ATL Luxury uh, is asking, A1C requirements for diabetic type 2. Great point. Um, good question. With liposuction, I mean, obviously you don't want somebody who's like, you know, in, 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 in a very high A1C just because from a health standpoint, but Really, as long as we within the norm, um, it doesn't affect much in terms of what, what we do. I mean, unless your HbA1c is like 10 plus, you know, but anything within the norm, there's no contraindication. Again, it's fully awake. It's um, um, the, uh, with what, I mean, from a medical standpoint, really what we look at is the heart uh, more than the HbA1c or if somebody had like you know, whatever history of some sort of cancer, that the heart is key because we're injecting fluid uh, into the body and then we're liposuctioning that. So when you inject fluid, you're adding, and the heart is a, is a pump, it's a machine, basically it's pumping all the time. So when you add fluid and if somebody has, don't have good reserve, then you can add to the, to the muscle of the heart and that can cause 
rhythm problem or you know problems with that. So we need to really look at the heart, making sure the heart is young and healthy that can accommodate the amount of fluid we're pumping in and then we're sucking out. But other than that, I mean, if your blood sugar kind of like that, I'll just say kind of, I mean, get it as good as you can get it, but it's not like a contraindication. Um, one is asking local anesthesia. I mean, that's all what we do is local anesthesia, like pure local anesthesia. That's pretty much it. No sedation, no IV sedation, no general anesthesia. We used to do all that stuff. So let me tell you about, so we started general anesthesia for everyone, right? And then and patients did well. I mean, that's the thing, patients did well, but their immediate recovery, I mean, they were like light, dizzy, lightheaded, this, that. You wheel them out to, to, to the car and I was like, ah. then we started to doing it away, but under sedation. They did better, but not like perfect. And then we did to awake under PO pain medications like Percocet or stuff like that. They did better than under sedation, but not. But now we don't even give them anything by mouse. We don't give them Percocet, we don't give them anything. We just give them Tylenol and Advil. Because we found when you don't give anything, there's no, we don't take the inhibition of the frontal lobe out. So they actually do much better. And sometimes like I see a patients, if they're not doing very well, I'm like, did you take anything, especially on that second procedure? Like we do one on Tuesday and one on Thursday. And if on Thursday I see they're having like more discomfort than on Tuesday, I'm like, did you take the Percocet from yesterday, this morning? Because I can tell, because if they take it, they're going to feel it more. Because they take the, it's opposite of what you think as a patient. It's like, you know what, I'm going to load on that so that I don't feel anything. It's the opposite effect. So the less sedation you give, the better experience you're going to get. And again, like we know that the hard way, I mean, because we've done hundreds and hundreds of these. Um, Vilma is asking, I have a big tummy, so it's possible made by liposuction to downsize. Again, if the fullness is from lipidema and, and fat fullness, yes, it works today. But if your fullness is from fat under the muscle or excess skin, then, then lipid lipo is not going to help you. It's going to be a waste of your money. I was asking, is it possible to use IV antibiotics instead of oral afterwards? I've worked really hard to repair my gut after the past antibiotic use. I mean, you can. Some people, we tell them, if you don't want to take antibiotics, don't even take it. So with liposuction, with lipid lipo, and I've had few physicians who say, you know what, I don't want to even take my antibiotics. It's like, okay, no problem. Don't take it. It's not like... Oh my God, it's not like you're doing a knee replacement or so with lipid lipo, it's not like, so if you don't feel like taking antibiotics, I don't think it's worth getting IV access and getting like, you know, outside IV antibiotics at home for liposuction. It's just the risk outweighs the benefit. So I would say if you don't want to mess up with your uh, uh, gut bacteria, don't take any antibiotics. Good question. Um, Taylor is asking, does your office work with insurance at all? We don't. Um, we don't. And the main reason is with insurance work, they value quantity, not quality. Because if you think about it is, let's say, okay, you do lipid lipo and then we're going to give you X amount. Now, if you do a great job or if you do crappy job, the insurance are going to do the same, right? So basically, you're not, the incentive is not there to give a great job. So, and the insurance will give you to a point where you need to do like three or four a day, two, three or four a day to be able to compensate so the numbers make sense, right? So then what happens is the, the hospital or the physicians are kind of stuck because the hospital tells the physician, hey, you got to do four of these so the numbers work, right? Otherwise, we're going to kick you out. Because the insurance is giving them based on the numbers. So it's a numbers game. Now to do four a day, guess what? The quality is going to go down. So for that reason, we say we don't take insurance and we do one a day. And that's a decision. And, you know, like, do, you, do we want high quality and low number of people and not do insurance? Or we want high quantity, high number of people and take insurance? Kind of like, and that's a decision that, you know, that, that, that patients have to make, physicians have to make, and practices have to make. 
So let's say if I work in a hospital setting, right? Basically, they will fire me the second day. I will be fired 100% because I'm going to go there and I'm going to say, hey, listen, guys, we're going to give the best outcome possible. We're going to take our time with the patient. We're going to do one patient today and we're going to make sure they walk out with a big smile on their face. They have a great experience, but we're only doing one patient today. And they're going to be like, just, you're out. Because their numbers don't make sense. Because the insurance is going to pay them that much. It's going to cost them that much to run the operating room and the staff and all that stuff. And then they're going to lose that much money on me. So they're going to fire me. Because, but they tell me, listen, if you can do four cases a day, now they can make that much. They're paying that much and now they're making that much money. They're like, okay, great. We want, we want to hire you. So you got to understand that as a patient on the other side. And um, it is what it is. It's so unfortunate, you know, like the, the insurance companies and the hospital, they just control everything. They really do. And, and the physicians are kind of stuck in that position where, and I, and I promise you, I think most physicians, they want to do the best for the patients. They want to take the time, they want to give the best outcome possible, but they just can't. They're in a position that can't. We've been very lucky, like, we operate um, not in a hospital setting and we have our patients who are amazing and come to us and kind of we are selective in a way where we go after results and quality. And the day we can't go after quality and results, we won't be doing it. I mean, it is what it is. It's just because the outcome that matters, the quality is what matters. You know, it's... Um, and, uh, and it's a more personal thing. Like if that was my wife or my daughter, this is what I, I want them to go to a place. That's all what they do. They're, they're them, they're VIP. They stay there all day. They take care of them. They get the best outcome possible, the best results possible. And it's just like, yeah. So we don't take insurance. Um, uh, MB uh, Pruett is asking, is there a directory of physicians who diagnose and treat lipedema? Um, good question. Uh, I'm not sure about that. In our practice, we don't require official diagnosis because we can tell based on the signs, symptoms, and the way and the, and the pictures. So you don't need an official diagnosis for that. Um, Annie is asking, are lipomas a part of lipedema? You know, we've you can have lipomas with lipedema, but you can have also li lipedema with thick fibrous nodules that look like lipomas. Uh, yeah, you can have, uh, uh, you can, there are certain diseases where you can have, like Durkheim's, where you can have lipomas kind of in that. So irrespective, you gotta spend the time, break things down, do the liposuction and that part. But if somebody has just lipoma by themselves, they need the general surgeon or the plastic surgeon to take that lipoma out. But if the multiple nodules are part of the lipidema, do your lipolipo first and then decide on those lipomas. Because if you go in and resect it and take that out, that's going to create a, uh, an empty space, scar tissue, contour irregularities, it's going to make your liposuction harder. Do the lipo first and then if there's any residual stuff, because most of the times you'll be fine, you might not need anything. And if there's any residual stuff, then you would resect it. It's like no different than veins. Do your lipolipo first and then do the veins, because most of the times the veins get better just with the liposuction. Um, great points. Joanne is asking, do you ever come to Canada and educate professionals on how to perform lipedema surgery? Um, not at this point. I mean, I am involved on, on, on the um, kind of going to conferences and stuff, but uh, and that's something I need to work on. But again, with my practice, the way that we are, I mean, we're like always fully booked here. So I need to kind of, maybe in the future, kind of as I get older, maybe kind of dedicate some time for teaching and going and doing that. But currently we just don't do it. We get a lot of, a lot of Canadian come to us for the lipedema surgery. Uh, uh, Joanne is saying that's all I hear in Canada, live with it. Yeah, unfortunately, yes. I mean, it's kind of, I don't think, I think Canada definitely, there's a huge need for the pedema specialists there. Um, it's just um, not many people do it. And uh, um, 
it, it's so unfortunate. And that's the thing with lipedema. The, the learning curve is so steep that most people, when they start kind of like dabbling into it, they get complications, they get unhappy patients, they get issues, and then they say, you know what, I don't want to deal with it. And it's tough surgery. I mean, it's like, it's a lot of work. You know, it's a lot of work to do great job. So, so the surgeons then like, you know what, it's just not worth it. You know, it's so much on my shoulders, on my, my neck and that, and it's very hard. You know, they do it, they do few of it. And I say, you know what, I don't want to do it anymore. Or it's kind of like, you know, this, um, this, especially if they're doing insurance, it's just not worth it for them. Um, um, Nunes is asking, I just joined the live after surgery. How long is the recovery? Um, so again, patients walk out immediately after. I mean, there's no recovery from general anesthesia. The main recovery is bruising and swelling. So basically, I walk, the pa I walk with the patient <laughs> at the end of each surgery. It's like, okay, hey, how are you doing? And, and sometimes patients consent that I go lie. I mean, I, you know, I take a selfie video with them. Um, so, I mean, the recovery is, but that being said, you're gonna have bruising, you're gonna have swelling, pain's gonna kick in after like 48, 72 hours when the numbing medicine kind of goes away. So there is, some recovery, not like general anesthesia or sedation, but it's like the best recovery you can have uh, um, because you have no, no anesthesia. So, um, just just saying people with gut issues like IBS should not do tummy tuck. Um, that's, with tummy tuck, I'm gonna like, you know, we'll talk about lipedema, so, uh, um, uh, Marsha is saying, is this surgery safe for someone with microvascular disease? Good question. I mean, it depends. Like, I mean, is it like if it's the disease, is it arterial disease? Is it venous disease? If it's a vein disease or the varicose veins, m most, most lipedema patients have varicose veins and varicose problems and kind of like that. And then we do lipolipo on them and they do very well. But let's say if somebody has microvascular disease, like peripheral arterial disease and they have problem walking, they don't have enough blood supply and blood flow to the legs, then you don't want to do that because that's going to stress the body and can potentially cause any issues. So it depends on what type of vascular disease the patient has. Or if it's a heart disease or aortic arch disease and stuff like that, you don't want to do the surgery. It's too high. It will put you at a higher risk of complication and you want to do it in a hospital setting. But if it's a venous disease, then that's easy. Not easy, but it's like, that's, we see that very common with lipedema patients. Um, let's see kind of what other questions we have here. We're almost at one o'clock and I'm gonna see a patient here shortly. Uh, I was asking, when can I fly, uh, after the procedure, when can I fly back home? Most of our patients, they fly back in two days after the procedures. So usually what we do is we do, uh, uh, they get two se if the if the blood count is above fourteen, we do one session on Tuesday and then another session on Thursday, and then fl patients fly back on the weekends, uh, usually. Um, how can we? Uh, Lord Badger is asking how can we treat loose skin post lipo below the knees? You know, I can most of my patients, especially below the knees, the skin does very well. We, we, we almost rarely have any patients needing skin resection, especially below the knees. If lipo is done very well, if you're doing lipi lipo, especially if you're stage one, stage two, you just don't need it. Now stage four, massive weight loss, yes, you'll need skin resection. But stage one, stage two, and below the knees, the odds of needing skin resection, I mean, it's almost zero. Um, you gotta make sure you go to an expert. You really need to, guys. Um, um, Media says, hi, dog, big fan for a long time. Uh, do we need to get into a specific diet after the surgery? You know, get question, very good questions. Anti-inflammatory diet is key with lipedema. Uh, keeping low on sugar. Sugar is, you know, lipedema fat cells, they love sugar. Uh, so you gotta start them, and the way to start them is like minimizing sugar intake. So healthy diet, lifestyle is very crucial for after the surgery to maintain uh, long time results. Um, I'll take one more question here, and then I gotta go. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Joanne is asking here. Um, 
how long after lower leg surgery should fly home safely thinking about the blood, blood clots good question i'll say 48 hours after the surgery if you're overseas cross atlantic i tell them three days stay here for three days but most of the times the key is to compression keep walking on, on the plane and drinking tons of water to stay hydrated because if you keep walking and you're drinking a lot of fluid the chances of blood clots is like very minimal because the procedure is done awake there's no general anesthesia there's no sedation so patients are walking after surgery before surgery kind of like so um the chances of blood clots is very 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 low awesome guys well um Thanks a lot. That was a great session. Um, I'll save it here if uh, somebody wants to go back to uh, some of the questions. And again, if you guys have any questions, uh, please let me know.